So hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to the latest in Global Corporate Venturing's new live webinar series, The Next Wave. Uh, for today's show, we've got a very good one dealing with space technology. And it's uh, titled, if my screen, uh, if my slideshow will move on to the next one, Investing Beyond Earth, uh, Can CVC Be One Giant Leap for Space Tech? And yes, that is a play on Neil Armstrong's classic line, for those of you wondering. Uh, space is called the next frontier for a reason. Uh, not all that much is known about anything beyond our own atmosphere, generally speaking. And among the many things that we're starting to figure out uh, about our cosmos is how we're gonna do business out there, right? What are space enterprises uh, even gonna look like? What do we need to produce to create an economy in space? Uh, how would it work at scale? And by extension, what's the best way to invest out there? Um, and these are questions that are being actively worked on by members of today's panel. Uh, who'll be able to uh, who'll be able to more capably shepherd us through, if not the precise answers to those questions, then certainly you know what the known unknowns are as we stand now and where we may go from here. Uh, so a quick disclaimer first, uh, this webinar is uh, for informational purposes only and shouldn't be construed in any way as investment advice. So here we've got uh, today's participants. Uh, it's a really it's a really cracked panel. A um, lot, lot of information that, that these guys can, can give today, and I'll give them a chance to properly introduce themselves in a minute. But we have uh, Roe Furman, Managing Director of Doral Energy Tech Ventures, or, or Doral Tech for short. Uh, Jonathan Geifman, CEO of Helios, a company looking to, among other things, uh, mine the moon for oxygen and clean up the steel industry here on Earth, and it's a portfolio company of Doral Tech. Uh, then we've got uh, Timur Davis, a principal at Munich ReVentures. And uh, Daniel Faber, CEO of Orbit Fab, which aims to develop a network of gas stations in space or fuel stations in space, and is a portfolio company of Munich Reventures. Um, and before we, we, we get to the discussion, I just want to very, very briefly go through a few quick slides to give a bit of an overview and, and set the stage for where we are in terms of, of venture investments in the space industry. Um, so here we've got, um, I look at the rise you know, since 2016, in, in CVC and corporate back deals in space tech. Um, and, and here we see that both, uh, both the deal count and the capital invested, uh, it kind of stayed steady until around 2019. And then it started going up very fast. So it doubled by the time we got to 2020 and then more than tripled again by 2021. Um, now, of course, we all know that 2021 was something of a, of a freak mutant outlier of a year, pretty much across the board. Um, so, you know, we've, we've seen something a bit similar in terms of the pattern here as, as we've been seeing in other sectors, and that is a, a correction in 2022. Uh, however, uh, while, you know, overall investment uh, volume in terms of dollars has gone down uh, between last year and this year, the actual CVC deal count has continued to rise, right, showing an enduring um, appetite despite the wider market uncertainty, and even though even if ticket sizes are, are, are smaller, uh, people still want to put money in space. And even after a roughly you know, 66 or whatever it is percent drop, the capital invested is still higher than any year before 2021. Um, moving on to the next slide here, we just looked at VC back deals and we're seeing a kind of a similar trend. Uh, deal count uh, has gone down quite a bit, um, though it's still higher than every year um, you know, pr uh, prior to 2021. Um, and the investment dollars have not decreased uh, nearly as much as they have uh, for, you know, the, the CVC counterparts, um, you know, it's just gone down here, uh, according to, to PitchBook data, from $8 billion to $7 billion, as opposed to the kind of $3 billion to $1 billion we saw on the CVC side. Um, and this is indicating, you know, a strong and continuing demand for exposure uh, to space tech. And just as a, as a final kind of preliminary slide here. Uh, Here's a kind of general overview of the cost of space flight um, over time. Um, and, and we're seeing that, especially in, in, in recent years, it's really uh, over the past you know, decade or so, it's really kind of plummeted uh, by about a factor of, 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 of 10. So if we look up here to the in the top left, you know, number three here, the space shuttle we're, we're talking about, um, you know, well north of, of, of $50,000 per kilogram in order to get stuff up to space. And then you know, f fast forward to you know around 2008, 2009, you have SpaceX coming in with their Falcon One. Uh, at that point, you know, 
the cost of sending up a kilogram of cargo up to space is somewhere around 12,000 ish. Um, then fast forward again to Falcon Heavy, we're talking about less than $1,600. And uh, projections are showing that by the time it comes out with its Starship, and by the time that's operational, we're looking at something like $200, um, according to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, per kilogram of freights up to space, which historically speaking is, I mean, I don't want to say uh, negligible per kilogram, but certainly a complete game changer. Um, and, and keeping in mind that this is a, this is a logarithmic uh, graph, each mark on the vertical axis is roughly double the one before, the actual uh, pace of, of, of the cost coming down is, is, is actually uh, much more dramatic than, than it actually even appears on this graph. I wanted to give our panelists a, a chance to, to all kind of take a, a brief 30 seconds to, to introduce themselves, um, you know, tell us about themselves and a bit about their companies, and perhaps we can start off with, uh, with you, Rowie. Hi everyone, uh, greetings from uh, Israel, um, and I'm really happy to be here, so uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm the Managing Director at Doral Energy Tech Ventures, which is the corporate innovation and investment arm of Doral Energy. Doral Energy is a global renewable energy developer. We develop renewable energy uh, projects globally, solar, wind, energy storage, um, biogas, waste energy, and so on. Uh, within our portfolio, there are 15 companies from Israel, uh, from the US, and also from Europe. And one of them is Elias. Uh, and again, happy to be here. Thanks, Rui. Uh, perhaps uh, Timur, you could go next. So, hey, everyone. Good, good morning, good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Timur Davis. I am at Munich Re Ventures, where I lead our transportation and climate investment sectors. Um, within transportation space is, is a key um, element of, of our investing uh, thesis and, and a key topic for us. Uh, Munich Reventures is a, a billion dollar uh, uh, fund, a uh, corporate fund of, of Munich Re based in San Francisco. Um, and, and we invest across a, a fairly broad set of, of topics, including obviously insure tech, IoT, uh, cybersecurity, equipment, um, climate and transportation. Um, and we've got several space companies, including uh, in our portfolio, including OrbitFab, uh, which is uh, being represented by Daniel today, um, and uh, a company called Okapi Orbits, which is a, a space situational awareness company um, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Timur. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, thanks, Fernando. Uh, real pleasure to be here. OrbitFab, uh, my, Daniel Faber, CEO of, of OrbitFab. OrbitFab is building the industrial chemical supply chain in orbit, in space. Um, that starts by building the downstream. So we're launching fuel, uh, we're distributing fuel and selling fuel. That's uh, our primary business. We've got a lot of uptake from the US government, uh, as well as commercial companies that are now realizing that they can have reusable satellites. They don't have to throw them away when they run out of fuel, but also they can have the mobility and flexibility in business models and in operations. Uh, so we have three CBCs on our cap table at the moment. Uh, Munich Reventures with uh, with Timur have been an excellent partner for a number of years. Uh, both Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman also joined about a year ago. So uh, we have very good relationships with those uh, those corporates. Fantastic. And finally, Jonathan. Thank you, Fernando. Jonathan Gaifman from Israel, uh, CEO of Helios. Uh, we are developing novel uh, approaches and methods to refine minerals for the sake of metals production and oxygen without using any earth brought consumables like carbon. For instance, uh, we were using these for these technologies uh, for terrestrial uh, use cases like for the steel industry, copper, nickel, silicon, and more uh, to reduce carbon emissions, energy consumption, and production costs and also in the space industry to refine lunar regolith to produce oxygen, uh, mostly to refuel uh, future uh, vehicles that will require a lot of oxygen, uh, like for instance, Starship, that is going to be nearly 70% oxygen by mass when fully loaded. Perfect, no, th thank you all. And, and um, I'll, I'll get right to it because I know that we have, a, we have a lot to get through in, in just uh, one short hour. So uh, just a quick note to listeners, this is a, an open forum. So we strongly encourage everyone listening to send in your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom throughout the talk and, and we'll do our very best 
uh, to get to them. Uh, now, to begin with, I, I thought we might start with the with the topic of that last slide that I showed. So, so the so the incremental kind of and and dramatic drop in in costs of, of space flight. So, it, which has been you know historically the the biggest uh, prohibitive hurdle uh, for space. And now that they've come down by about a factor of ten in as many years. Um, the, a door has been effectively open to to a whole new world of, of investment opportunities and, and and other opportunities. And I want to open up, you know, the question to the panel. You know, what in your view have been the biggest drivers of these cost reductions, and what implications do they have on the creation of this new ecosystem? Uh, maybe maybe Daniel, I, I know you have some uh, some views on this question. And we've definitely seen a uh, a lot of new startups. <clears throat> entering recently we we have a facility in Colorado that we moved into a year ago we've actually got uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, startup companies moved into the same facility uh, so we're able to create an ecosystem here um, we see the corporates being interested in these from uh, a number of different perspectives a lot of what's driving that is the increased government interest um, and we've seen VCs now um, having more of an appetite for uh, government um, for businesses that have uh, a component that is is government business, whereas previously that was uh, was not so attractive, and that may be a, a feature of the economic environment. So the uh, the ecosystem that's grown up, sort of supporting each other and, and growing a lot of things, is now getting government support. Uh, it's getting VC support, and uh, and we're getting CVC support as well. If 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 I can jump in a little bit, um, so this. Of course. The, the chart you showed and the evolution in this market is, is really fascinating. Um, and, and I'll kind of maybe talk about this a little bit through the insurance lens, because uh, many folks may not be aware, but Munich Re is actually, um, I believe, the largest insurer of space, uh, meaning both uh, the launches as well as on the orbit in space assets, right? Think of like property or liability insurance. Um, and so, up until um, you know, less than 10 years ago, when those price decreases that you showed really started to come, uh, you know, space was the domain of large governments and kind of big defense contractors who serve those governments, right? Launches were very expensive, they were fairly rare, um, and you know, were very exquisite, right? You were launching a you know, $500 million satellite with a 20 year lifetime as the sole passenger on the rocket. And so from the insurance perspective, you know, this is a, a single huge policy that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars with, you know, maybe tens of millions of dollars of premium. And um, uh, you are working hand in hand with the owner of the, the, the asset with the launch company really formulating um, you know, very complex uh, financial product. And, and maybe you do a couple of these a year, right? Maybe. Um, and, and now as those launch costs have declined dramatically, everyone is launching things, right? And, and they're launching things on ride shares where you can have you know, 10, 15, 20 plus different um, spacecraft on, on a single rocket being deposited into different orbits in LEO versus GEO, right? That whole paradigm is changing and those, those launches are happening daily, literally daily in some cases, right? And so if you are looking at it through the insurance lens, it's, it's a complete, um, kind of reversal, a complete change of the industry, right? Because now you have to move quickly, right? You don't have an opportunity to build, you know, close relationships with every single small sat manufacturer and really understand what their asset is doing and how it's gonna do it. Um, the prices, the cost of these satellites is changing dramatically as well. It's no longer several hundred million dollars. It could be, several hundred thousand dollars, right? For a small nano sat, maybe a couple million for something that's a little bigger. And the lifetime 
of those assets is is changing as well. It's no longer twenty years. It's it's maybe three years, maybe maybe five if you're lucky, right? Um, and the risks of being in Leo once you're in space are are dramatically different as well because the the risk of collision either with another satellite or with a piece of space junk or what have you um, are much greater than if you're you know uh, in in geo orbit where there's you know, a handful of satellites and a ton of space. Um, and, and sorry, so, just, just for the uh, just for the benefit of the audience yeah. who might not know what Leo and Geo are, could you just uh, explain that very briefly? Yeah, uh, apologies. So, so Leo is low Earth orbit. That's um, sort of the orbit that begins at I think about five hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface and then goes for you know uh, the, I forget maybe up to a couple of kilometers. And then Geo is short for geostationary orbit, which I believe is around. 30,000 kilometers away from the Earth, but someone will probably correct me um, in the, on the panel. Um, so though it used to be, just to come back to this, it used to be that folks were launching into GEO and they were launching sort of huge communication satellites, for example, 36,000, thank you, sir. Um, and, and, uh, and now that paradigm is, is obviously changing. And, and so as insurers, we really have to change how we're looking at that market. We have to change how we think about it. We have to change how we're underwriting it. We have to change our risk tolerances and the volumes, as you can imagine, take someone who's used to writing one policy a year and tell them now we have to write one policy a week, right? Uh, it's, it's a different ball game. And, and through our venture investing, um, really what we're trying to do is bring in really new, innovative, um, exciting concepts, such as what Orbit Fab is doing, pull it in close uh, to the family, so to speak, and then establish those relationships with our colleagues in Munich on the insurance and underwriting side um, to kind of help them think about what new space looks like from an insurance perspective, and maybe what are entirely new business models that can uh, um, that can kind of evolve out of this because, for example, and sorry, I've been speaking for a while, but the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, if you imagine in the past, the insurance was really around, is my thing going to hit someone else's thing? And if so, who owes who money, right? And now the insurance can be around, you know, with refueling, for example, uh, there is a business interruption that happens because a refueling didn't occur at the time or in the place when it was supposed to occur. And so is there an insurance payout that's connected to um, that business interruption, right? Or if we take uh, what Helios is doing, sim similarly, um, you know, if, if there are certain resources that need to be extracted at a certain time and they aren't, is there a performance guarantee around some of those technologies um, such that people are willing to uh, essentially get involved in these risky new business models by having someone else take the technology risk associated with them. Right, and that, that tees, uh, that tees uh, Jonathan up uh, quite nicely there to, to kind of continue that, Jonathan. How, how, how have the kind of fallen costs affected you? Would you be able to do what you're doing now, say five years ago, five, seven years ago? 10 years ago, most likely not. Uh, just, you know, thinking of sending uh, a small box to the moon will be unconceivable back then. Today, we have a price tag. I know it's like $1 million per kilogram. Uh, it's definitely doable. We can send a small box uh, to demonstrate our technology uh, before scaling up and, you know, de-risking uh, uh, the, the technology before we move forward. I can also comment on what I, I think will be the key drivers for the continuation of this cost reductions. Um, and one, the, the, the obvious aspect is Starship, or I'd say uh, 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 fully reusable vehicles that can be uh, used uh, rapidly, uh, reusable vehicles. Uh, not only first stage, but also second stage, it deploys satellites, landing back, get refueled, launched again. Uh, so this by itself uh, at large scale uh, and economy of scale uh, will keep on, on uh, pushing these prices down. And the next uh, step would be 
to get a significant part of the mass you need uh, in space, not from Earth, uh, completely bypassing uh, the need to launch and you know overcome Earth's gravity, and whether you get it from near-Earth asteroids or from the Moon. Uh, oxygen, which is going to be one of the by far most uh, uh, needed uh, uh, materials uh, when we talk about uh, systems like starships and other uh, fully reusable vehicles that are probably going to rely on methane uh, uh, for uh, their, their, their propellant. Um, and metals as well. I mean, uh, these system mega structures, et cetera, uh, maybe not for tomorrow, but you know, a decade from now, definitely something uh, that can be evolving and also reducing costs. Yeah, and can you talk a, a little bit actually about the relationship? Uh, obviously, mass to to dollars, right? It's 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 per kilogram. But what about you know methane and oxygen to mass? What, what's the relationship there? Okay, so we can take uh, Starship as an example. It's a good example because we know what are going to be the ex expected figures uh, there at the moment. There are other fully reusable. Uh, vehicles uh, that you know are being uh, worked on these days by by SpaceX competitors as well. Uh, but if we'll take space, Starship as an example, so um, the expected expected total weight of the vehicle when fully loaded, including the weight of the vehicle itself, is going to be around fourteen hundred tons. Uh, around give or take a hundred tons is the weight of the vehicle. Mm. Another hundred tons is the cargo. Astronauts, whatever. Um, then you have uh, something like uh, 250, uh, uh, 200 to 250 tons of methane and nearly a thousand tons of oxygen to burn the propellant. This is, uh, you know, from a, a chemist standpoint, it's obvious, but it's not that obvious uh, for everyone because we don't think about it when we burn something. Uh, we need oxygen with indefinite amount in the air. Uh, so when you burn one kilogram of methane, uh, it sucks four kilograms of oxygen from the air. And again, we don't think about it, but when you go to space, you need to take that oxygen with you. Uh, you mm -hmm. have no choice. Um, yeah, so the, the very means by which to burn propellant adds weight and therefore adds cost to any flight. Yeah, that's the tyranny of the rocket equation. Yeah, there's no yeah. way around it. Uh, we live on... Uh, 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 Earth gravity. Uh, we we're not we're not that far off from not being able uh, to escape Earth gravity at all if Earth was a little bit bigger. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> well, and and Roe to 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 bring you in here. Uh, Timur mentioned you know what what you know the approach to space looks like from from an insurance perspective. But what about from an energy perspective? You know when when Helios came along. Uh, what, what did you see in, in that company that made you feel okay? This is something that I can that I can sell to my investment committee. And what, what did you need to to show in order to get them on board with it? Um, this is a great question. I think that the space is a matter of first of all flavor. Um, there are some investors that really deter from that uh, in terms of by saying this is future looking, too too risky for me. I cannot really understand and capture what does it mean. And there are others that would like this story and would like this the, this opportunity. From purely investment, from purely energy perspective, I think that there is a lot of impact in terms of how do we uh, come up with alternatives either for uh, minerals, materials uh, from other places, and, and also in terms of um, how do you utilize better and accurate information from satellites to forecast uh, generation or to, or to for, uh, renewable energy, energy generation, and also to think about can we come up with new generation on on at space basically um for us it was more i would say probably practical approach because if it was just a moon or space story i guess that from our perspective it would be more uh, complex selling uh, to the ic uh what we really liked about uh Elius, uh, is that they're riding on on a few uh waves that move in in parallel and are interconnected the first one is the decarbonization and the climate wave. So for example, only after Elias trying to experiment new stuff on or to produce oxygen on the moon in a zero carbon environment, they came up with a novel approach to produce green steel or green metal here on Earth. 
uh, so some, some time times you know invention comes from uh, in, in the least in the less expected uh, way uh and see since we see ourselves as a core enabler in this uh, decarbonization of uh, our debate industries such as the steel industry as a renewable energy company so for us it fits pretty well with the strategy of how can we come up with an energy efficient solution and to contribute with our green electrons into such uh complex projects so the selling was started off with after we see uh more let's say um, practical, but practical is in the mindset of the psychology of the investment committee, best way for uh, revenues here on earth, more near and are uh, and more easy to, uh, to understand type of industries. And, uh, and, and then to come up or in parallel to start developing the forces towards uh, the more space applications. Uh, so for us, this hybrid view of there are very significant wins that Elias can win here on Earth in fundamental things that humanity tried to, to solve, such as decarbonization of the steel industry, for example, or to come up with new materials. Um, we saw a far more clear pathway within our, with our, within our IC uh, to get connected to such uh, vision and then to go to see the broader vision of reaching out um to space and i think that uh you know there are you showed a little bit the numbers in terms of investment and and obviously there is the market the macroeconomics environment and what we call market conditions these days uh so i think that uh when some type of the space tech businesses are capital intense and require lots of funds so one way to continue and and to generate revenues and to attract investors and to also to fund some by their own pocket. I think um, the ability to come up with businesses that are more near in the near future is also important uh, uh, to serve the greater story and the great and the greater vision of the of each startup. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, important point that that you know terrestrial applications can be an in to get more you know or, or to 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 get corporates from more varied sectors involved in the space industry right because you, you see how can it be applied here and then following from that how can it be applied uh to our to the version of our industry up in space i, I think that's 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 quite interesting um and how, how did it work for you timor because you you perhaps weren't as um as um as, as perhaps you know reliant on the earth facing uh, element of it and and you're kind of you know looking more towards towards space because as you mentioned munich re already has a very um kind of robust uh, uh you know business link uh, to 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 spacefaring uh, kind of enterprises uh, how how was it for you to to sell a company like orbit fab yeah so when we um when we set out uh as we've evolved our fund um you know we've tried to balance sort of you know the moonshots, for lack of a better word, with with stuff that's that's you know more near term and and you know more easily accessible, I, I guess. Um, but we, as we've evolved, I think we've realized that there's a need uh, to have stuff in the portfolio that you know is you know potentially long time horizon, but huge payout. Uh, you know, high risk, high reward. And, and so about three and a half years ago, we, we um, started or I, I took charge of, of a new um, uh, part of our platform that at the time we were calling deep tech, right? And, and the objective of our deep tech thesis was really to look at stuff that's way off on the horizon um, that has a lot of technology risk associated with it but also could, you know, either dramatically change existing markets or create entirely new markets. Um, and within that deep tech thesis, we had, you know, we, we looked at a bunch of topics that, you know, quantum computing and, and this and that, but space was, was always a key part of that. And, and obviously it's evolved over time. Now we have an entire transportation thesis where we look sort of beyond space, but 
we started from the beginning, I would say, of our exploration of what's out there with space, because we, I think, came to realize very early on that the potential of, of um, you know, what is possible in space is tremendous and in large part thanks to the reduction in um, launch costs, which you've highlighted, but, but other technological advancements as well. Um, you know, new space and, and kind of Leo and all these things were opening up uh, an industry that used to be, as I said, the domain of governments and kind of very large defense companies and nobody else. Um, so I think we approached Orbit Fab and, and other companies in the space with, with a very open mind. And, and the idea is ultimately like, look, if, you know, if this company is successful, this is, you know, a trillion dollar, whatever, you know, put, put whatever logo, whatever label you want on it, but it's, it's a tremendous opportunity um, financially and strategically it is uh, strategically meaning for our um, for our uh, uh, colleagues in in Munich that are looking at the space industry as a business today. Um, you know, we were looking for opportunities that will help kind of expand their thinking, um, and uh, you know, maybe create have help them create entirely new business models or you know new revenue sources or something like that, which at the moment, you know, they, they, they don't have. So I would say space in general and Orbit Fab in particular are, are topics where, you know, we, we see kind of big financial opportunity, obviously high risk, but also really interesting strategic interplay. Um, <clears throat> and so, and so I, I think, you know, the internal sale to our investment committee was, was obviously not easy. Nothing is easy, but it, it wasn't um, like, I think the investment committee was very open-minded and very open to new things. Now that having been said, obviously we did a lot of work to get folks comfortable with it, right? That we we wrote um, you know an entire thesis on the space industry and and did a lot of analysis of what the different segments um, in space uh, that that we felt were going to be the the largest opportunities. Um, we think, uh, you know, one of those segments or, or kind of core to our thesis is this concept of, um, you know, the picks and shovels, right, building out the infrastructure that will ultimately be the foundation on which um, the future space industry is built. And, and the beauty there is we don't have to know what the future space industry is, right, we, we don't know what's going to happen in 50 years. But I'm pretty darn sure that um, for a lot of those business models to close, you're going to need to have some kind of refueling or mission extension capabilities, right? You can't just launch, you know, a spacecraft, have it do one thing, and then forget about it, right? When you buy a car, you you don't you know empty the tank and drop it on the side of the road, right? Um, we think that's going to be important. We also think that space traffic management is going to be important. We think space sustainability is going to be important. That's, I, I know there was a question in the chat about space sustainability. I'd love to have a chance to talk about that as well. Um, you know, we, we also think that servicing in space is, is going to be important. And so we've spent a lot of time looking at that topic. So I would say overall, um, you know, given that we have a business that's focused on space, maybe the sale, sale, quote unquote, was not as difficult as if Munich, we never looked up. Um, but at the same time, we had to be very thoughtful and, um, you know, very analytical with uh, the, the particular segments that, that we thought would be the biggest financial and strategic opportunity. Great, thank you, Timur. Um, and just to, as a reminder to the audience, uh, we, we've started getting some some listener questions, so so keep those coming in, and and we'll get those uh, get to those as as um, as soon as possible. Uh, before we do, though, I wanted to to get, uh, you know, I, I wanted to to get the opinion of our of our two founders here on the panel, Daniel and Jonathan. Um, obviously, the the one of the the USPs of any CVC investor is that they can bring more to the table than just capital, right? Whether that's in-house expertise or, or introductions or, or whatever it may be. 
Um, and and I want to get your uh, your your takes and and pretend that Timur and Rowie aren't here for a second. Oh, <laughs> what what's um what's it been like to to have you know corporates on the cap table? You know what what have they you know enabled you to do that perhaps you wouldn't have uh, been able to do just with with you know just purely financial investors? I know uh, so Daniel, you've got Munich Re and as you mentioned the the oil and water that are uh, that are Lockheed and, and Northrop. Um, and then Jonathan, you you have Doral, obviously, and also a, a quite large uh, global mining company on your cap table. Um, so perhaps you know you you Daniel, you could start off uh, telling us what 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 they've kind of you know brought to the equation. Yeah, thanks. Um, so there's and Timor gave a, a really good description of how they approached it and, and why they're approaching it. Um, and you know, in cases not clear it's, it's obvious why we love having two more on our board and, and munich re involved in the company um very um very thoughtful and considerate that is one of the things that that they've brought right is is just that experience knowledge of uh um how to how to analyze the business how to analyze an industry uh and how to think about it and their you know decades of experience not just in insurance but specifically in underwriting satellites and rockets so when we look at uh, at cbcs there are really three sort of um reasons or, or groups uh, of cbcs from our perspective uh one uh, is the direct space company so northrop lockheed for example um these companies have a a large portion of their business in in the space industry you'd think of them as aerospace companies and so <clears throat> for them um you know for for them we we are looking directly at uh at we're doing business with them at being able to help them bring in new revenue and uh and for us to to capture sales and get inputs on our products and those types of things. Um, the second group are companies like Munich Re, where a significant part of their business is space, but it's not the largest part by uh, by any stretch. So they understand space, but they see that segment of the business um, experiencing possible disru disruption uh, and definite growth potential. So those ones have uh, adjacent business models that we can learn a lot from. Uh, we definitely need to have insurance wrappers around how we sell fuel and our financial products to lower our cost of capital and to, to reduce risk for uh, our customers and reduce risk for, for our business. So we benefit from that. And, and there are a number of companies that, uh, that are in that category. The third category is companies that really aren't space companies. So Jonathan can probably talk about having a, a mining company uh, on the cap table. Uh, for, for us, we've had many conversations with those types of companies and uh, you know, including industrial gas supply companies and oil and gas companies, where we want to be that company in space. And I expect over the next 30, 40 years, every industry will start operating in space. And in 100 years, the, the economy in space is quite likely to be larger than the economy on Earth. And so those companies are looking for a seat at the table, right? Their industries are, are likely about to start operating in space, and some of them sooner than, than others. And so for those CBCs, it's about being informed, it's about seeing where the trends are going. It's about being able to take opportunities and work with the picks and shovel companies, companies like uh, uh, OrbitFab and, and Helios, to be able to leverage that and uh, start doing small things in space and finding what the business is like and growing it. So those are the three, and they bring very different things. We are most interested really in the business models that apply to us and uh, and those types of things. So oil and gas and industrial, um, industrial chemicals, of course, are... are almost parallel to us. We're just taking those business models and applying them in space in a place that, that hasn't um, had those business models before and there are nuances and we're figuring out those nuances. So that for us is, has been the real reason that we've been interested in getting CVCs on our cap table. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I just want to make a side comment. Um, there is today, there's like this distinction that you have, you know, terrestrial industries also, all sorts of uh, different verticals and you have the space sector like it's a uh, it's its own vertical but actually it's just an extension of, of everything else the space sector has like so many different verticals within it uh and in you know the way we see it is just we we are in the business of resources okay so we're you know we want to produce metals whether it's here on earth from asteroids on the moon it doesn't matter uh, you have energy balances uh, there. It's it's all part of this game, and space doing this in space is just a natural extension to what 
we're also trying to do here. So this is just a side comment uh, to also how we see uh, our uh, these specific CVCs that in our case are not from the space sector as also natural partners, um, whether it's from the energy sector or from the material sector. We also see ourselves, you know, as a, let's say a small speedboat that tries to navigate in this big ocean of uh, uh, destroyers, highly geopolitical plane fields, um, and and working together with these uh, uh, big corporates uh, that can open the right doors, uh, that have their you know government uh, uh, relations, uh, that know how to how to operate within the you know uh, realm of export control and and all of all of these. Uh, things that as a small startup seems uh, very scary in the beginning and like you're completely clueless about uh, how to handle this, uh, especially uh, we're entering uh, these type of of industries, whether it is steel, critical metal space, uh, it's all under the same national security umbrella. Um, so, so I'd say that this by itself is a huge uh, benefit uh, for us uh, when we work uh, with with a corporate like Doal or or Anglo American, which is our uh, mining company uh, on, that is on board with us. Uh, also, um, when you know when we're talking about mining industry, uh, we have access to raw materials to or all all these different types of ore uh, that you know it's not something you can buy. Uh, it's like super proprietary, um, and to have access to these materials is is uh, amazing. I mean, this is something allows us uh, to run our proof of concepts, uh, to to demonstrate the technology under uh, real industrial environment, uh, and for us, it's key uh, to move forward. So, oh, great, <clears throat> thanks, Jonathan. And I think that's a, that's a good time to to move on to our first uh, listener question. And this one comes in from from Greg Watson, uh, who asks. And by the way, this is open to 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 the whole panel who asks, uh, what approaches are the panelists taking to deal with satellite deorbiting and to manage the risk of the buildup of junk? I'm happy to start, uh, although I think Daniel has more to say. Um, so, and, and maybe just to provide a little bit more context, um, I, I think the question is around space sustainability, uh, which, which is really important. Um, and, and the reason is there's this, um, uh, uh, problem called the Kessler syndrome, I believe, which is basically that um, if you have enough uh, collisions in space, those collisions will set off an avalanche of additional collisions and so on and so forth. And then ultimately space is sort of, or low earth orbit rather, is uninhabitable, right? And forget it. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's it's everyone's responsibility to do everything we can to sort of mitigate um, the risk of Kessler syndrome. Um, where we sit is, um, you know, we want to find opportunities where uh, there is space sustainability, but at the <coughs> I'm sorry, but at the same time, there's some kind of commercial um, business model underpinning it, right? So, for example, uh, there are a whole host of companies that are really focused on debris cleanup, let's say, as their primary business, um, which uh, is great and incredibly important, but I don't think we've yet seen um, the, uh, the commercial side of that, right? Right now it's, it's very government focused and, and that's fine, uh, but, but it, the business model needs to evolve. So the way that we've been looking at it is across a few dimensions. The first is obviously um, refueling, right? <laughs> That's why Daniel's here. Uh, it's it, and and beyond that, it's it's mission extension, right? It's um, if and it's servicing, right? It's if you have spacecraft that are able to uh, dock, for example, with other spacecraft that are able to. Um, you know, somehow interface that are able to inspect, that are able to um, uh, repair uh, and so on other spacecraft, then um, 
you know, you just, you get much more useful life and, and, and sort of useful applications out of space. And, and, and by extension, you, you know, you may need to put fewer things up there, for, for example, or at least you're going to use things better. And if, if for example, a, today, if a satellite, you know, has an issue with its solar panel, uh, and now you, you, you can't, you know, you can't maneuver it, that's it. It's, you know, let's say it's dead, right? If tomorrow there's a world where you can service your spacecraft um, and, you know, send something else to manipulate it to take care of it, then, then that's obviously very important for sustainability. The, the other way that we're looking at it is with um, space traffic management and space situational awareness. So I said, and this is our other portfolio company in the space, Okapi Orbits. Um, and what they do is essentially track everything that's in space, both satellites and uh, spacecraft, as well as debris that's larger than a certain size, let's call it 10 centimeters. And, and that threshold will always be getting smaller and smaller. And they warn um, the satellite operators about the risks of collisions, which are known as conjunctions in space with, um, with other stuff, whether it be other spacecraft or, or space debris. Um, and, and so, you know, as um, if the forecasts are as expected and there's gonna be, you know, 10,000 satellites launched in the next five years or whatever that forecast is, the need for um, avoiding, uh, uh, well, one, for monitoring everything in space and then two, um, developing maneuvers to avoid the uh, collisions or to minimize the risk of collisions, that's going to be very important as well. And again, you know, there's a business element there, right? These, uh, uh, and maybe this is to Rowie's point, um, you know, earlier, right? Uh, a company like Okapi is able to sell to satellite operators that are operating with constellations today, not in 10 years. Um, right, maybe the need is less now than it will be 10 years, but the need is already there. The risk of conjunctions are very much there. Um, so that, that's another way that um, we're looking at sustainability in space. Uh, so uh, I'll hand the microphone over to <laughs> someone else. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, sort of put this in a, in a pretty clear context as to why you know, we are support, how we're supporting this. Basically, if you want to deorbit satellites or, or space debris, you need fuel. Um, there's when we started the company, there are eight or nine satellite servicing companies, tow trucks in space, um, companies working on that business model. Now, uh, two or three of them are operational, but there are 120 companies working on tow trucks in space and a whole bunch of different business models. Deorbiting is just one of, of several, um, you know, from repairs to upgrades to life extension. Um, if you're looking at a tow truck for deorbit, you get to you get to tow one to two satellites. So it's like building a shiny new tow truck, going out and towing one or two cars and then throwing away the tow truck because you ran out of fuel. Right? It, it does not make sense. Um, so refueling obviously is necessary, but by, by the numbers, there are companies building 50,000 satellites right now, these, these new uh, mega constellations, Starlink, Telesat, OneWeb, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of others. The average failure rate on satellites in orbit is about 1%. Just 1% of them die because of radiation issues, software issues, like things go wrong. Um, that means that there's 500 satellites a year that are going dark in the middle of these busy operational orbits. And Timur mentioned the cascade failure consequence, right? You, you do not want that. So there is an incentive for the companies to clear up their junk. But uh, in the US, it's regulated by the FCC. There's a, a, a UN uh, guideline to remove debris within 25 years so that we don't have too much of an issue. The FCC requires that satellites carry a thruster to be able to get out of orbit, but they only require a 90% reliability that the satellite will actually be operating at the end of its mission, which means that 10% of these 50,000 satellites may well end up as debris in orbit, 5,000 satellites. And that's that's what's planned now. And eSpace, uh, Greg Weiler's new company are planning 300,000 satellites. So do the numbers. All right, this is this is not a great problem. So, so we've talked to the FCC. Uh, they don't accept refueling as an option now. You have to carry a thruster uh, because it hasn't been proven. Right, companies are just starting to demonstrate this. Once it's demonstrated and it's cost effective, they've indicated that they're likely to make it a requirement that everybody 
has a contract to, to deorbit in case they fail, which basically is going to look like an insurance policy. So uh, you can imagine why, why Tamur is, uh, is taking an interest. Um, but if that's an insurance policy and maybe it's, you know, the premium is 10,000 a year, uh, there's 500 satellites to be deorbited, you know, gives you a million dollars uh, to, to run that deorbit operation. That's a $500 million market opportunity. So by providing fuel in orbit, we are trying to help some of our customers that are these tow truck companies realize this $500 million market, solve this massive problem that, that we're now sort of heading towards. So we will solve it, but that's, that's how we're going to do it. Yeah, and just to and clarify just for to clarify. my audience, uh, when people say space debris, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's, it's traveling at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. So it's, it's a pretty significant problem that needs a, that needs a solution. Um, yeah, I'm I, I conscious that we only have uh, slightly less than 10 minutes left on our allotted time. So I, I want to quickly uh, seize on something that, um, that you mentioned in your, in your previous uh, response, Jonathan, about the kind of geopolitical pitfalls around, around operating in this space. And uh, probably, you know, in, in, on this call, given the, given the subject matter, probably most of you uh, have seen the movie The Martian. Um, and what, one of my kind of favorite parts of that is where is where Matt Damon's character is in one of his video, um, you know, blogs. I was talking about how because of his situation at the time and what he has to do, uh, he's technically a space pirate, right? And and that's it's it's a funny line, but it also uh, highlights something quite important, and that is that the the legal and regulatory framework of operating in space is uh, at best unclear uh, and 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 a bit murky. So I I'm I'm curious to know. Uh, how it's factoring into um, how you guys operate or, or if it's, I mean, is it too early right now to be thinking about that kind of stuff? I know it's probably different uh, for you, Jonathan, if, if you're establishing, let's say, you know, bases or, or operations on the moon versus, you know, perhaps you, Daniel, that, you know, you have your gas stations traveling at tens of thousands of miles an hour. So I, I don't know if, 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 if that makes your viewpoints different at all, but how, how are you thinking about it? Still relevant aspects, but I'll let Jonathan go first. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, when it comes to the moon, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, being done, you know, under uh, all sorts of uh, uh, international uh, committees in the UN as well. Uh, the Artemis Accords uh, are trying to, to, to mitigate some of these issues because then um, it is going to be a wild west, I guess, uh, for a while. Uh, even if there are laws, there is no one there to enforce them uh, uh, for quite a while. Uh, how do you, um, okay, let's say you set a base somewhere, you're exploring, you're starting to mine something, you're selling it. I mean, who gave you the permission to explore? Um, who said that, that this, these materials, you, you can uh, commercially own them and then sell them? Uh, so these are a lot of uh, legal aspects that are being uh, they try to solve them today. There is a NASA uh, the, uh, mission uh, that uh, is going up soon to the moon uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, a company called Lunar Outpost is going to sell uh, some lunar regolith. They're going to scoop some regolith and uh, uh, to officially make a transaction uh, with NASA just to make this like as a, uh, uh, this precedent that 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 this can happen under the U.S. law because in the U.S. there's an internal law that says that you can uh, sell uh, uh, resource that you excavated. Uh, it also applies in, in Japan and the UAE and Luxembourg, and I think that for now that's it. Uh, we're an Israeli company, so we're hoping that you know at some point. Uh, the Israeli government will participate in this as well. And if not, we'll have to see how we, we solve this. Um, so, you know, just, just like a few aspects of, of these issues. And it's hard to say how this will evolve, but it will evolve. And it will be a wild west for a while. Um, but yeah. So to, to throw some things in from the, the orbit fab perspective, we, we want to be taking material from asteroid miners and turning it into propellant, but other industrial chemical feedstocks. So we want to see that solved as well in exactly the same way that, that Jonathan does from moon or, or asteroids. Um, but we look at uh, a lot of other things in the international um, 
environment are, are not really nailed down yet either. Um, if you take fuel on one launch and put it into another tank, who's liable? Um, those, those things matter. Uh, there's just a lot of things that haven't been done before and, and haven't been tested. Norms haven't been established. I expect what will happen is that, that people will just do things. And as long as nothing goes wrong, no one complains and there's no issues, that will become the standard practice. But um, that's, that's got to be worked out in, in the measure of time. We, we don't know what we're going to need yet. And so there is a risk of, of policymakers getting ahead of, of what's practical um, and making sure that, that the industry has a chance to sort of find its feet, if you like. So we keep a, a, a close eye on where things are going um, and monitor that. One of the big things that we are um, most interested in is, is the rendezvous and docking aspect, because uh, if we were to be, uh, if, if a satellite servicing company was to be involved in a collision and create debris because of the, the high velocities and energies involved, uh, that can impact third parties quite significantly. And so, uh, every country at the moment under international law is liable, but how that is passed through to the companies is uh, is not exactly uh, clear and varies country to country. And so those are the kinds of things that are that are going to have to get worked out um, from a, from a sort of liability perspective. That's the thing that, that we immediately are uh, are concerned with the most. Uh, thank you both. And I think with with one minute to go, I think there was there was one uh, final question there for for you, uh, Timur, which I think you started answering on the on the chat. But uh, you mentioned you know having formed a thesis for 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 the for the space investments, will that be you know made available for for others who might be uh, interested in investing to to see? Yeah. So obviously we we can't publish everything because um, a lot of it is based on sort of internal Munich Re um, uh, sort of proprietary information. But um, uh, we we do you know feel strongly about um, sort of the the things the elements of our thesis that are shareable, which, some of which I've highlighted on this conversation. And so um, we've uh, started to put together a series of blog posts or a series of articles on um, topics in space uh, that we think are particularly interesting from an investment perspective and, and why. Uh, the first one, um, which will be sort of a general overview of in space servicing is expected to be posted either at the end of this year or more likely early next year, early next month. Um, and, and for now we're posting them on LinkedIn, uh, but, but soon they'll migrate over to our uh, website. So, um, you know, thank you for asking and, and you've given me the chance to do a little bit of, of advertising. Um, so uh, please, you know, keep an eye open. Um, we'll have something published soon. And, and we're super excited to, to create more thought leadership, um, particularly among corporates uh, in, in topics like space. Well, perfect. Well, thanks for that. And and with that, we are just about out of time. So I want to thank each and every one of you, uh, Roe, Timur, Daniel, and Jonathan for, for joining us. And it's been a really uh, fascinating conversation. So so thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and before we uh, sign off, uh, just a couple of, of, uh, of uh, housekeeping things uh, from my side, and I'll, and I'll share my screen uh, once more. So our next uh, web webinar, which will be, uh, it's, it's a monthly webinar, so the next one will be in January, and it'll be titled uh, Wiring the Corporation, Creating New Pathways for Disruptive Innovation. Uh, that's on January 11th, uh, so uh, keep an eye out for the registration links for that, because um, it, it'll be a good one as well. Uh, upcoming events uh, on the GCV calendar, we've got the, the big one, the GCVI Summit in Monterey, California on March 15th and 16th, as well as the uh, London edition, the GCV Symposium in uh, late June 20th to the 21st. Um, and uh, if, if you want a special discount code uh, to register uh, right now, you put in uh, the next wave um, and you'll get a nice 10% uh, discount off those 2023 tickets. Um, we would also you know, greatly appreciate it if you uh, took some time to fill out the GCV Touchstone Annual Corporate Venturing Survey we want to get as, as many people uh, to, to fill this out as we can to have the, the, the most you know, uh, comprehensive um, you know, collection of information from, from, from the CVC world as possible uh, uh, for, for everyone to, to look at. We've been obviously collecting nominations for rising stars and emerging leaders. 
uh, coming up to, to the closing of those nominations. So please do get them in so that uh, we can uh, consider them. Um, and with that, if you wanna contact us or myself, there's my, my email or reach out uh, with any questions you may have. And um, we can also, um, if you have questions for, for the panelists as well, we can, we can help uh, connect you too. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. And again, to the panelists for speaking today. Have a great one.